Yesterday, the school boards for three cities and four counties in Virginia filed a lawsuit against the state's new governor, Glenn Youngkin, over his executive order creating a parental opt-out for mask mandates in Virginia's public and private schools. The school boards, which collectively serve more than 350,000 students, say the executive order is a, quote, clear violation of the school board's constitutional rights and responsibilities, end quote. What about the rights and responsibilities of parents? Well, here to talk about what's happening in Virginia and uh, what is most likely going to be happening in communities all across the country is Meg Kilgannon, Senior Fellow for Education Studies here at the Family Research Council. Meg, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tony. It's great to be back. All right, let's start. Uh, several things happening in Virginia, and uh, you know, parents have upended politics in Virginia, and it's not going to be contained to the old Dominion state. I believe it's going to be moving to states all across the nation. In fact, our listeners can help make sure that that happens. But before we get to that, while uh, these schools, um, you know, clearly they're govern governed at the local level. Uh, weren't these school boards more than willing to bind, blindly follow any edict from the state government when it was run by a Democratic governor, Gover Governor Northam? Yes, but let's keep everybody comfortable before we let them die, Governor. They were perfectly willing to follow the health care edicts from that governor. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been really interesting to see. We have all the media attention on these seven counties in Virginia that are challenging the governor's edict when it, it's not even an edict, it's an executive order, which governors are certainly permitted and, and allowed to, to make. Um, he, some 135 school districts across the state are, are following the executive order. They were happy to have it ordered. Um, the order says that parents are the ones who will decide if children are masked in schools. So for these seven counties that, and four counties and three city school systems, um, there's nothing preventing the parents in those counties from sending their children to school masked. And if they go to school with the mask on, the people at the school will allow them to keep that mask on. Um, what the executive order simply does is allows parents to decide what will happen. Will the child be masked or not? So the school systems in these, in these localities, which the, if you look at the last voting totals in the last election, I, you know, one of the largest margins for Yonkin, I think, was about 30 percent. So these are clearly Democrat majority counties and cities that are challenging this. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it's going to play out in the courts. The attorney general and the governor are asking the state Supreme Court to act quickly on this, and hopefully they will rule quickly on this. Um, but this is a really interesting case to watch, and it's a really gratifying case of an elected official who ran for office promising to respect and defend parents' rights. And the governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, is actually doing that, and parents yes. are grateful. Yeah, they are, and it's, it is it, because it factored so heavily into his election. Now, you uh, were in the Department of Education under the Trump administration, uh, of course, running at a, a kind of a different focus than the present Department of Education and most Department of Educations in the past. But the educational establishment, as long as there is a liberal in charge, they're like Briar Rabbit. They're happy to be thrown into those regulations. It's when parents come in to the equation that they get upset. And this is where Governor Yunkin has is given the educational establishment in Virginia indigestion because he also announced a hotline for parents when it comes to divisive material being introduced into the classroom. Tell our viewers about that. He did. Another of his immediate executive orders on his day one agenda, promises that he's kept, we're very grateful for, was to uh, ban critical race theory from classrooms in Virginia, to, to ban the teaching of divisive concepts. And he is um, set up a, an email portal for parents so that they can report problems that they see in their schools. Um, immediate, immediately after the issuance of that executive order, there were reports of a school in Fairfax County teaching a high school level course that included a bingo game, a privilege bingo game, 
where um, you were told that if you served in the military, if you lived with a military family, you had privilege. So the, the, the dynamics around this whole concept of who's privileged and who's not privileged and who's oppressed and who's the oppressor, these are the divisive concepts that we're talking about when the governor mentions this in his executive order. So it's clearly and, and something that's needed. Right, because parents have had no place to turn. They've gone to school boards like they did in Loudoun County only to be, you know, in some cases, tackled and stuffed and cuffed, you know, cuffed and stuffed and taken away um, as they've raised concerns about what's happened there. But this, Governor Yunkin said, they want to begin to catalog and they want to deal with facts. So they're collecting all this information. Reminds me uh, of what uh, the lieutenant governor in North Carolina, Mark Robinson, did uh, last year or the year before. He, he solicited from parents examples. They verified them. They put together a report. And it is comprehensive and it is hard to refute when you have basically chapter and verse of what's happening in classrooms. Right. They did the same thing in Idaho. So it really is going on all across the country. North Carolina had their reporting portal and they were, the, you know, got plenty of examples of what curriculum that needed to be addressed. They did the same thing in Idaho. They had a, a committee that was set up to review that material. And um, these efforts are not just, you know, a political gamesmanship, as the mi mainstream media would have people believe that the right is just ginning up hysteria over critical race theory. Um, that's not what's going on. This is a case of parents who are responding to what's happening in the classrooms, which they were able to see because of the virtual learning during the pandemic. And now that parents are aware that the education their children are getting is not the education that the, the parents got in schools. This is a very different model of education that focuses not on learning, but more on indoctrination and activating children as radical activists who become so, change agents in society. Right. So parents, especially those of you who are living in Virginia, because the governor has asked for this, you need to help him out and, you know, have conversations with your kids about, hey, what would you learn today? What were you taught? What would you hear? And, and report these things. And it's better if you can actually get, you know, screenshots or copies. Not too many schools have textbooks anymore. Everything is kind of digital. But if you can get it and then provide that information to the hotline for the governor. I don't know that I have the hotline. We'll see if we can't get that up on the, on the website. But I certainly encourage you as parents to be involved. I mean, here we have a governor who's saying, I need your help. I need to help. I need your help cleaning up the schools. Now, um, Meg, to, to, to your point about this is all over the country, recently in, uh, in St. Paul, the St. Paul school system, I mean, this, this is outrageous. And again, it's not isolated. So folks, when, when I talk about this, when we talk about this, don't think, well, that, that wouldn't happen in my school district, wouldn't happen in my city, wouldn't happen in my state. Don't be so sure. In St. Paul, the public schools, it's partnering with two organizations. And these are, these are LGBT advocacy groups. They're indoctrinating toddlers. I mean, as young as three years old about pride and other equity agenda items, including basically choosing your own gender. I mean, these are kids that can't even tie their shoes, and we're trying to teach them about gender. I mean, Meg, what's going on? Well, this came to light because the Minnesota public school system is reviewing their state standards for social studies curricula. And so um, the, just like the governor of Virginia is asking parents for help, uh, parents all across the country are giving help, whether they're asked or not, and we're very glad to see it. Parents have discovered this um, curricula and reported it to the folks that are reviewing the social studies material. And it is really, um, really <laughs> incredible that it does target children as young as three years old with messages about their gender, their boys that could be born girls, their girls that could have been born a boy, non-binary identities, um, the kind of thing that encourages the questioning of identity in very unhealthy ways in children at ages that are really not capable of making these kinds of discernments. 
when when a Man. child is that age, you know, they know a boy, girl, good, bad, <laughs> pretty much, you know, things are in very limited categories in that age range. They're not equipped to deal with this kind of thinking. And it's all done in many cases away from and without the knowledge of parents. In fact, it's hidden from parents. And it doesn't stop just with the toddlers. I mean, it goes all the way through. There was one handout uh, that the Parents Defending Education presented. It uh, told teachers to ask students for name and pronouns and to refer students to the name gender change request form. And of course, all this is done without parent parental information. Another group, they're uh, out front Minnesota. Their website includes links to programs that provide free chess binders for folks 24 and under. And for any trans person who needs one and cannot afford one safely, they can obtain one and even has a way for you to have it sent to someone else's home so that your parents won't know that you're getting this. This is happening in the classroom. The thing that's really dangerous about those kinds of efforts is that the parent will be deliberately kept in the dark as a not safe person for this uh, non-binary student who's identified themselves as such at school. But the, the school will partner with groups like this group that's providing the chest binders, and they will refer children into groups that are for ages 14 to 24, for example. So these are not necessarily safe environments for teens to be engaging in groups of that age range. And certainly it is not appropriate for schools to refer them into those groups without parental permission. Right. This is just... And, and basic. And well, it, it should be basic. What should be front and center for our schools is maybe, maybe, maybe they should think about teaching our kids to read and write and do mathematics. Um, and, and what was pointed out in St. Paul, the students, te they were tested proficient in their proficiency in reading and only 33 percent only 33% of the students are proficient at their grade level in reading. That's down. That's actually dropped since 2019. 21 tested proficient in math. That's down nine points. So we're, we're doing all of this other crazy, nonsense, make-believe stuff, but we're not teaching our kids to read or to do math so that they can compete, not only globally, but just compete and get a job locally. Right. And the, the the thing that's so interesting about the case in Minnesota is that it's it's been revealed that the the for example the social studies uh, review of standards that's happening you have an ethnic studies curriculum in California that is targeted as a high school requirement and they have for the first time ever made ethnic studies a requirement for graduation from high school. Minnesota is having a oh wait a minute let me see if we can do better moment and deciding that they're gonna have ethnic studies throughout the K to 12 curriculum in each grade. And they're reviewing the standards to that end. And so parents really need to, to stand up and serve on these committees that do this sort of work of reviewing the standards like this. Um, you'll get, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on of, you know, well, if you don't have a PhD in history or economics, you're not qualified, that's not true. You're talking about K to 12 education. If you're a high school graduate or a college graduate even, you have well, confronted this material before and you can <laughs> review these by, standards to see if they're appropriate or not. By today's standards, if you can just read the word that's on the bathroom, <laughs> you could qualify. Um, because obviously there are some that cannot do that much who are leading public education. All right. Um, before we run out of time, Meg, there are ways that people can make a difference and they're doing it all across the country, running for school boards, being involved. We've got a FRC Action has a training session coming up on school boards. Tell us about it. We are, we had our school board boot camp online in June that was really well attended and is still available at our website, but we are going to go to Raleigh, North Carolina and Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll be in Raleigh, February 9th, and we'll be in Charlotte, February 10th. And we will be hosting a school board and local candidate training uh, session in those two cities. We're really excited to offer this. Um, 
this, these events in North Carolina, to be out in the, in the states and to meet people where they live. The panels will feature experts from North Carolina, North Carolina uh, school board representatives and others running for office, um, school uh, people in North Carolina who are familiar with the issues that are impacting that state, who can help help candidates uh, who are thinking about running, you know, understand what those issues are and speak intelligently about them. Um, so we're really excited about this event. We're partnering with uh, North Carolina Values, Tammy Fitzgerald's group there, and the uh, FPC there in North Carolina as well. And um, you can register, you can find the registration links at frcaction.org slash schools. So All we'd right, love it we'll... if you live in those cities or anywhere in North Carolina, join us. February 9th right. and 10th. We'll have a link up at TonyPerkins.com as well. Meg Kilgannon, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for stopping by today. Thank you.